Hi there guys, and welcome to another episode of Rant Radio Live, and we are broadcasting this week from Florida, and we are at one of our many pit stops that we're going to be making on the road with the Wandering Zuccotti's, our Occupy bus tour, so I hope you guys follow along with us as we will be streaming that event, but to start off tonight, um, I'm going to be talking about the UN, we did try to uh, record from our previous location, but we didn't have very good service. So we are going to be redoing the show tonight. So if you guys were watching and you were able to hear the audio, some of this may be a little bit of a repeat, but I'm going to try to uh, mix it up and keep it interesting. I do have a lot of info for you guys tonight, so do bear with me as I try to get through all of my rant. And uh, I'm going to start off with a little something that I've written, which is uh, partially taken from the piece that I used for my research tonight, um, which is from the David Horowitz Center for Freedom. It's a Freedom Center uh, website. They, uh, they focus on getting out real information, and uh, definitely this article had a lot to say about the UN, so I used that as my inspiration for going off. And uh, as when many of you guys may know, there have been some attempts at picketing at the UN this week even, and um, we've been trying to pick it in front of the UN as well as Occupy in front of the UN for a while, and we're not very, uh, we're not getting that far, to, uh, that close to the building rather. I don't know more was trying to get there today um, as we're recording this, and they weren't able to. So the UN doesn't like protesting, and there's a lot of reasons to protest them. So I'm going to start off with my little blurb, and then I'll get into the 10 reasons why we should just abolish the UN altogether. So beyond the mirage of democracy, and human rights is an organization that answers to the worst elements in the international community. It is an undemocratic collective of tyrants that have weaved a bureaucratic web that falsely promises protection to the oppressed peoples all over the world. Instead, its interventions often contribute to the crimes that it claims to be against. Its efforts are only to serve its own greed its own vanity, its own power, and cowardice. It's a vast global agency, with no purpose, really, except to perpetuate its own power and authority and to not enforce international law on any of its members. The body of the UN, the physical core that makes up the Security Council, they don't have to live by their own standards, and they sure don't have to play by their own rules. It's a vast employment agency with facilities that mask the corruption and the incompetence to actually live up to its rhetoric and live up to its declaration of human rights. But from my experience as an activist and as somebody who wants to protest and push the boundaries of free speech and what is actually allowed and what you're actually allowed to say, the UN's International Declaration of Human Rights doesn't really hold up for me and I have been jailed for simple things, as you guys know, and many people have been jailed for even dumber things than I have. So, why have an International Declaration of Human Rights? Why have an organization that is meant to stop war crimes, that's meant to stop genocide? And how does this organization get its funding? So we're going to get into all that and really try to understand the UN and get a good grip on whether or not this organization should actually exist and why the U.S. in particular is pumping so much funding into it. So the first reason is because the United States is having its job obstructed. America is not able to defend the free world. Now, I would disagree a little bit with this first one because I feel that the U.N. is actually a huge perpetrator in preventing freedom at this point. The UN's um, agenda towards the US has changed a little bit and actually the US has come under fire for not protecting civil liberties and not allowing uh, protests to peacefully assemble and happen. Um, however, the history of the UN is pretty shaky and they're very, very hypocritical. So since the 1920s, when these first uh, peace treaties began to be signed, within 11 years, uh, about half of the signers of the peace treaties were at war with each other. So right off the bat, the UN isn't doing anything good. All of its members are starting to feud with each other. They're not respecting their own commitments. And uh, most of the 51 founders, in fact, were at war with each other before that and before the Nuremberg Charter, which was in 1945, and of course that was the famous case 
where all of the Nazi generals were put on trial for genocide. And uh, it was from then on that they were trying to prevent these genocides from occurring again. But this has been going on. And back then there were already about 50 million dead as a result of these wars that are technically illegal under international law. If these countries were actually going to uphold the treaties that they signed. But we know that that doesn't happen. So the United Nations is also a force of global injustice. This is number two. They have held about 10 emergency sessions. And what the UN does is when something really bad happens in the world, the UN calls an emergency session. Or at least that's what you would think an emergency session is for. But actually, five of the sessions that have been held by the UN were to target Israel and uh, violations in zoning or really petty, petty charges that I don't think the UN should have been bothering with. The, the Israel shouldn't be getting off the hook anytime soon, but they're sure not going after Israel for the genocide against Palestine. And that's the problem. There seems to be a huge lack of priority in the UN, and they pick and choose what they want to declare deplorable, and pick and choose what they actually want to call a session on. But God forbid they call anybody out on actual genocide. Oh, no, no, no. See, all the people that are committing the genocide are on the member board, and that's why they're safe. So there's really no way for the UN to even prosecute anybody because the UN is getting their funding from all of these tyrants that are committing the crimes. So you're really backed into a corner, UN. I almost feel sorry for you. Oh wait, I really don't because you're obstructing the prevention of genocide and that's number four, or number three rather. So the concept of genocide, right? This is a massive extermination of people. This is a wipeout of, of either a targeted group or just a destruction of a whole population, right? This is, this is a, a heinous act. We never ever should do this. We learned from World War II what kind of uh, atrocities can happen from tyrants that are out of control. And they were prosecuted. However, the UN doesn't seem to really focus on the other tyrants that have been running rampant in this, in this world for decades. No one seems to be talking about what's happened in the Congo. No one seems to be talking about what's happened in Rwanda. Nobody talks about the epidemics, the starvation pandemics. No one talks about the people being persecuted in Palestine. The UN doesn't want to focus on that stuff. They thought they took care of all this in the 40s. Oh, we're just going to have a treaty. We'll put a few people on trial and everything will be fine. Just keep giving us money to be peacekeepers. And, uh, you know, that's a problem. If everybody's guilty, then no one is guilty. And if the UN actually decided to do its job tomorrow, the US alone could be prosecuted 12 times over just for the count of war crimes, just for genocide. 12 times over, we have committed these acts and we've gone unpunished. The Bush administration, the Clinton administration, the current Obama administration, this goes back decades and decades. All of our little puppets that we put into office, they all carry out the same plan. The U.S. is too big to fail, and they're too big to get caught for killing anybody. So they just keep doing it. And number four starts to deal with the women aspect. Now, of course, if you know the International Declaration of Human Rights <coughs> is supposed to be universal. So this is supposed to apply to everybody on Earth. I apologize, I'm about to cough. <coughs> I'm just getting over being sick. I'm so glad I got my voice back, at least. So, women's rights. We have the International Declaration of Human Rights, but there's also an Islamic Declaration of Human Rights, which is a little bit different, because women are not totally considered equal, and there are some restrictions on women's dress and women's position in society. So, when the UN's declaration was created, it was actually a, uh, a collaboration of different... Um, different groups like the Soviets, communists, uh, that came in and um, it was kind of a blending and a blurring of lines. So, so this is not a declaration that is really upheld all over the world. And especially for women, women are persecuted and women are, are trafficked, they are sold for sex, they are, they are literally starving, they are bombed, and there is really nothing that the UN is doing to improve the lives of women that are suffering in these nations where it is commonplace to be oppressed. And in the US, for instance, we take our liberties for granted, and women do have a lot of freedom in this country. Not so much as a protester, but definitely you can go down the street, and you can wear what you want, you can say for the most part what you want, you can go where you want, you can run for office, you have freedom there. 
you're not restricted in your dress, you're not restricted in your speech that much. Uh, in other parts of the world, though, women are born into slavery. Women are born into the sex trafficking industry, and this is disgusting. And the fact that the UN really only does as much as to shuffle the truth around in their rhetoric to not really improve anything except for the perception of, of how women are doing around the world. So to give a statistic, for instance, that says, oh, this country has uh, all of these women in legislation. They are doing better, and they are, they are improving in their equality between men and women. But what they don't know is that one out of four women in that country are raped. So not quite the best statistic and the best uh, interpretation of, of how it's really going there. So I have a big problem with that. I have a problem with the UN not really giving people an idea of the actual, the actual environment, the actual, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The actual temperature of, of, of these nations and whether or not they're, they're really doing well or doing worse or whether or not it really matters if women are in power, if women in the streets are still oppressed. So screw you, UN, us women are still pissed. Um, and the UN can't prevent nukes. This is a big issue with the UN. Now, all the big superpowers have nukes. Everybody knows this. Russia's got nukes. China's got nukes. We have nukes. Um, basically, all the treaty does is say, okay, all of you guys that came into the UN, you've all got nukes. That's okay. Now, we've just got to make sure that nobody else gets nukes. But there's a flaw in that operation. Because you can pretty much get into the UN get your seat, um, you, start, you start working your way into the policies, you work your way in the Security Council, and you can get nukes too. And then the UN can't do anything to you. If you get big enough, the UN really can't do anything. And all the UN does is send a little letter, they make a little announcement, and they say, oh, this is deplorable, this is deplorable. It's one of their favorite words, actually, to use. So all of the, all of the regulations that have been put on this material under control of, of an international body, it can't overrule um, the two world powers, basically, that are behind it. That's the problem. The two major superpowers that control um, nuclear proliferation are, are running the show. So this is out. There's no, there's no way that the UN is trying to prevent nuclear war. They don't care. They just want the money to keep coming. They just want to be able to renovate their headquarters. They just want to be able to get paid. So there's really no, there's no concern about nuclear war from the UN's end. And um, any kind of disarmament proposals that may come up, um, they usually get vetoed through the Security Council right away. These, these guys aren't screwing around. They're like, oh, oh, you want us to be disarmed? You want to take away our nukes? Bam, we're going to veto your ass. You can't do anything. And that's how it works. And that's kind of how our democracy works, too, in this country. Anything that has to pass through Congress goes through a lot of bureaucratic red tape, and whoever the hotshot is that says, oh, you know, that's going to affect my bottom line. I'm voting against that. Even if it's totally immoral and it's totally for the good of mankind, it doesn't matter. Because everybody's selfish and everybody's thinking about how they're going to protect themselves. So it's basically impossible for the UN to do their job in that way. And um, this is a democracy of tyrannies, which is the, the silliest concept, of course. Um, and, and the nuclear arms race continues. So everybody's making nukes, everybody's testing them, they're, uh, they're, they're pointing them at us that we speak. So what are you going to do? So let's see. They're pretty much undemocratic, right? This, this concept of, of this democracy of tyrannies, this keeps coming up, right? So the, the perversion of democracy, that's number six. Um, basically, a democracy of tyrants cannot possibly promote democracy. It just cancels itself out. It doesn't make sense, and any logical person can see that this is the dumbest uh, concept of, of, of running an organization that is supposed to be revolving around peace, and it's been completely corrupted from all levels. You know, according to the Universal Declaration, it says that the will of the people should be the basis of authority in government. It's, it's ass backwards right now. There, there, is no, um, there is no will of the people, and there's no way that we have any authority in government whatsoever. And especially in America, we are the authority of corporations. So even in countries that have parliaments, that have a dictator, that have um, different political setups, uh, you know, they, they are just as, as much of a disadvantage. Um, our tyrants come in the form of Goldman Sachs 
and Bank of America and BP. And, and that's the difference, is, is we have this indirect relationship with our oppressors and, and the people who are destroying our well-being in our, in our Earth. And in other countries, it's a little bit more blatant. Um, you can really put your finger on the exact person that's doing it. Uh, and if you look at the lineup in the UN, you know, all the heavy hitters are all the major superpowers, and they're all oppressing their own countries. They're all restricting their citizens' rights. And so they're all into, in, in it together. No one can be protected if, if the people running the show are, are a bunch of assholes. I mean, that's just, the, that's just the bottom line. So the UN is but an apparatus, and it is employed to protect its own violators. Everybody commits crimes, so no one's guilty. And the UN is hopelessly corrupt. And this is the interesting thing. This is number seven. Um, if you guys know, there was an oil for food program in Iraq. And uh, the UN actually had a $64 billion financial scandal because all of the money that was supposed to be going into this program was getting funneled to UN officials and to Saddam Hussein's uh, henchmen. So this was, um, this was a direct, blatant um, abuse of power and funds and uh, not that I really agree with this program, the fact that the money didn't even go towards the people, didn't go towards food, didn't go through assistance, it, d it didn't go through any of that process. It just went straight into the hands of the corrupt. And, and this, is, this is the kind of example of what they do. Uh, there's also been resignations from a ton of UN officials uh, when they have come under fire because of being accused of money laundering accused of being, um, being abusive of their own power. There's been countless ethical violations. Uh, there's tons of bribes for UN contracts. So they, they do a lot of screwed up shit and no one really gets uh, prosecuted, but, but UN officials get very uncomfortable when, when all this stuff starts to come out, so they resign. And then they just get a whole new uh, slew of lemmings to come in and do their job. And ironically enough, you guys mark it on your calendar because the UN made December 9th Anti-Corruption Day. So um, if anybody wants to plan an action for next year, I think we should uh, blow up the UN's cover and uh, do something on D9 of next year, uh, or this year rather. And uh, I think that would be really funny because the idea of the UN coming up with an Anti-Corruption Day is the silliest thing I've ever heard. So... Um, Oh, let's talk about the money. Let's talk about the money again. Number eight, the UN is an economic drain on the U.S. Now, I mentioned earlier that the U.S. funds the UN, and uh, we actually provide a quarter of their funding. So that's a huge piece of our budget that goes into the UN. Um, about $7.7 .7 billion was funded to the UN in 2010 alone. And uh, the, the other half of the UN funds mostly comes from members of NATO. So we're, we're a real big investor into the UN. And all of this money that goes into the UN is funneled um, from our domestic departments. So in 2010, the way it broke down was about $245 million came from the Department of Agriculture. $139 million came from the Department of Health. $50 million came from the Department of Labor. And uh, $75 million um, is not specified where it came from, but it was spent to renovate the headquarters because that's real important. 75 mil, you know, they're going real modest there. So the UN contributions from the US, it's, it's doubled since the 21st century. And at this rate, with how much money that we are pouring in, uh, by the end of the decade, it could be up to 15 billion. And then by 2030, we could be looking at 30 billion dollars that we're giving to the UN. Now, considering the fact that we just raised the debt ceiling, why are we giving the UN so much money when they are the most incompetent bastards? Oh, wait, we have to protect our asses because we're war crimes. That's why they do it. That's why they do this shit. They, prov they provide a quarter of the funding, and the U.S. gets all this protection, and it gets a little hush-hush from the U.N. So we can basically bomb Iraq, bomb Iran, bomb Yemen, bomb Afghanistan, bomb wherever else we want to bomb. We've got bombs everywhere. And no one is saying a thing because we give them so much money. We help them put that brand new corner office in that UN headquarters. I mean, it's just, it's just comical. Isn't this comical, guys? I, I have to laugh because otherwise I'd really just do something really stupid. But um, that brings me to number nine. 
The UN endangers American civil liberties. Now, we've been talking a lot about the Declaration of Human Rights, like this, this beautiful, pretty picture that the UN paints, you know, that, that this equality that is supposed to exist, the right to freedom of speech, the right to, to not be tortured, you know, it, it, it all sounds so great. It really does. But the problem is most Americans have to choose whether they identify with that declaration or they identify with the Constitution. And the two are not really compatible. And that's one of the problems is, you know, just the way state law differs from federal law, a federal law differs from international law. And for the average citizen, it starts to feel like the only reason these laws are around is to lock us up. It's not to lock up any of these big wigs that have all the money and influence, it's the little guy that, that wants to be heard or wants to make a change. Those are the people who are really persecuted by this disparity in laws. And it seems like the, the laws are just typical. It's just typical of a totalitarian um, state where they serve to protect the, the people in power and, and the laws are used to prosecute those that don't, that don't agree that don't want to fall in line, that, that want to, to air their dissent. So it's not really used as a universal code of conduct, and it's not really used to protect the average human on Earth. They're, they're simply another way that they play the game. They put these laws into place, it all sounds good, it's wrapped in a pretty bow, and as soon as you try to challenge it to see if it's valid, you guys know what happens. And this happens on an international scale, not just in the U.S., not just, you know, in countries that, that are having uprisings. This happens all the time, all over the world. There are very few areas on this planet that you, you can actually experience true freedom. And it's really, really sad. We have completely enslaved the world. And, and we sit by pretty helplessly while these tyrants just continue to run everything and and I, I don't know what it's going to take to change that I really don't uh, there's a lot more of us than there are of them but there's also a lot of serious brainwashing and um, lack of interest so we're kind of at a standstill with that oh I almost forgot to mention this this is my favorite quote that I found in this research the UN defines democracy as a journey not a destination so, so what a great concept, and I, and I hope the Founding Fathers are rolling in their graves right now, because the idea of it being a journey, oh, someday we'll get to democracy, someday we'll get there, oh, it's great. So last but not least, the UN holds human rights hostage, and it holds it hostage to its double standards. So shame on you, UN, you're such a damn hypocrite. You know, the idea of democracy and freedom and rights, they're all nice ideas. They're all nice ideas that no one on the member board practices, but they'll show up to the conventions and, you know, they'll pay a little lip service, they'll ratify some documents, and, and they'll, oh yeah, and they'll say that that stuff is deplorable going on there in Rwanda, and oh, that's deplorable going on there in Israel, and oh, all those people who got drone bombed, oh, that's deplorable. This had some pretty awesome... Uh, headlines come across the uh, the screens this week. Uh, CNN actually even acknowledged them for what they've been doing to some websites. So I think that I'm going to do a little bit of research. I'm going to talk to some of my friends, and I think next week might not be so much of a rant, um, but more a, of a of a kudos to Anonymous and what they've been willing to do. And I think that I'll wrap it more around the fact that these guys are being persecuted and that we don't know exactly how many of them there are, but they make themselves so much bigger than they seem. And I think it's an incredible thing that they've done. They create this mystique around the mask and around the headless logo. Um, I absolutely love them. And um, that is one of the few areas left where people are really able to take direct action in a way that is preserving their identity and their position but also sending a very powerful message and affecting how these, these motherfuckers look at us. So I think next week I'm going to talk about Anonymous, and we've got some great wandering Zuccotti buddies here that um, that will probably help me do that research as well. So thank you so much, guys, for watching, and um, definitely check out what Idle No More is doing. They were out in front of the UN today, 
and um, definitely do your research. The UN is always in the news, and it's really important that we are just aware of what these guys are doing, even if there's nothing that we can do to stop it. Let's be aware. Let's raise our consciousness. Let's, let's always keep learning, always be reading, and uh, you guys enjoy the rest of your night. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Lauren, and this is Rent Radio Live. Thank you all. We love you. Follow us on Twitter at J-A-K underscore N-L-A-U-R-E-N. Get live updates about our show, Rant Radio next week, and the amazing journey that we are embarking on. Um, guys, have a good night. Thank you for watching. Um, we love you. Thank you for all your support.